Welcome to The Liquidity Event, a show about all things personal finance with a laser focus on taxes, financial independence, and equity compensation. Hosted by AJ and Shane of Brooklyn FI, each episode will focus on a personal finance topic, some driven by news headlines, and sometimes driven by listener questions. And sometimes you'll just get two money nerds rambling about what they think is interesting. Just a quick note before we get started, this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered tax or investment advice. Hello, and welcome to the liquidity event where your host, AJ. And I'm Shane. And this is episode 124 being recorded on November 5th, airing on November 5th. I'm not, sorry, not November 5th. Today's November 5th. It's airing on Friday, November 8th. Uh, how are you what doing, are you, Shane? you not done this 124 times before? I've done this 123 times already. Uh, how are you? I missed you last week. Good, 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 good. Yeah, I was in Las Vegas for a conference. I think that's like conference number eight or nine of the year. I'm very much conferenced out, just like I am from 2023. The post-COVID conference, revenge, travel, good to see you. Let's see your new tech, tech stack, exhibit hall, speaking on stage. It's uh, it's a new lifestyle for me, but um, I'm over it. And You're over it? Believe me, a year from now, I'll be saying this You'll again. be back right in. You'll be jumping right back in. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we have a very short-term memory here oh yeah for sure i don't think we're very good at predicting what our future selves will want out of life just like our clients are you familiar with the three body problem yes the novel the you, novel and then oh the actual physics the physics issue or the, the novel? physics ish the well the novel i'm referring to the novel uh i, I could not e- finish the book it was terrible but the show i hear is better same, although I've been having some recent conversations, which makes me make me think I should try again because it is really interesting philosophical things. But this is not philosophical at all. Just the idea of having like a chaotic and a stable era. And it's like, are you in a chaotic era right now or a stable era? And I'm definitely in a very chaotic era right now. And I was mm. with my friends over the weekend and we were like, how do we manifest a stable era? Because you can't predict the, the, the chaotic and stable eras. That's the whole point. So mm. we were like, what is a stable era going to look like? We had like a brat summer whatever. We had like a chaotic era in the fall and now we're going to manifest mm. a stable making stews at home, not making bad decisions, not, not acting on every impulse. That's my vibe for the next couple of months. <laughs> I'm entering a stable era. <laughs> you heard it here first folks. <laughs> very fair. Very, I think the winter kind of, especially in New York forces a stable era on most people because mm-hmm. kinetically like just going outside is a nightmare. Um, then yeah. again, unless I, you're like us psychopaths who are on a flight yeah. every Two minutes, but the minute it drops below 52 degrees. <laughs> yeah. As soon as I was watching this, someone eat outside last night when I was going to dinner, I was like, it's too cold. First of all, it's too cold to eat outside. And once it's too cold to eat outside, I fly south. Yeah, <laughs> I'll for sure. For down sure. In Mexico City. Like a good, for, like the good goose you are. Uh-huh. <laughs> a silly um, ginger frying goose. Quick shout out for listeners. Uh, we are doing our famous year end tax planning webinar on November 20th. So uh, we'll have a link in our show notes or whatever to sign up for that. That's going to be our all star tax team and some of our financial planning team talking about things you can do before the end of the year, uh, which ties in very nicely to today's topic of conversation, which is charitable giving, because mm. usually at the end of the year is when people look at their tax return and they go to their accountant or their financial planner, they get a tax projection and their account and they go, Hey, accountant, what can I do to reduce my taxable income? And often there is no silver bullet, except one of those silver bullets is if you are charitably inclined, the best way to reduce your taxable income is to give some money away. Right. Uh, Mm -hmm. so we're going to talk about the pros and cons of all that. Um, yeah, that's all. Someone at your door. Yes, yeah, someone's at my door. <laughs> <laughs> you abruptly stopped talking. As my doorbell's ringing, and I think yeah. it is my T-shirts that I need for my trip tomorrow. So <laughs> I am going to hope that they buzz somewhere else. <laughs> okay. Anyway, all right. So, what are the? Wait, wait, wait. Where, we talk- Where are we going? Where are we going tomorrow, AJ? I'm going to Iceland. Hey, my hometown. <laughs> yes, your your ancestors. Well, my uh, ancestral hometown. Yes. You know, you know who I'm related to, right? Leif Erikson. Yes, dog. I know. I've, <laughs> I'm your freaking best friend. I know <laughs> you're related to Leif Erikson. We took 124 <laughs> episodes on the podcast to bring it up. Slow we've definitely, we've definitely mentioned Leif Erikson on this podcast before. Um, okay. So when we're talking about giving to charity, it's not just as simple as writing a check to your, your favorite 
fun, your favorite foundation, right? We're talking about more sophisticated ways uh, because in this country we like to avoid paying taxes. So there are lots of fun vehicles that we can put money into uh, to shield our income from taxes this year and give it away later. I am, of course, talking about donor advised funds. Do you have one of those? Do you have a donor advised fund? Yes, I do. It's called um, my house I just bought in, in Mexico City. It's That's getting not. all of my funds, and I advise that you donate some funds to <laughs> to my. You house. do not. You do not buy a house. You don't nor buy a house. <laughs> I have a meeting um, with an interior designer on Thursday, and she's going uh, to advise that I donate quite a bit of funds to the house. <laughs> That's funny. My interior designer just left and just advised that I <laughs> donate her more funds. Uh, um, can you define for our listeners what a donor advised fund is? A, a donor advised fund is essentially a nonprofit that allows for some interesting ways to donate to charity. Normally, if you need to donate to charity, if you're lucky, if you're rich, you have an accountant, you talk to them before the year is over with, before December 31st, because all tax returns are filed on a calendar year basis. So if you were to donate to a charity on, let's say, March of the year after you're, you're looking at your tax return, it's like, oh, my God, I made so much money last year. I didn't realize it. I'd like to reduce my uh, taxable income by, by donating to charity, it's too late. So you talk to an accountant in uh, December, maybe, and they say, oh, you're going to make too much money this year. You should donate to charity. You don't really have a lot of time in that case to, to figure out which charity you want to donate to, right? So like, you don't want to just throw it to some charity you don't really care about, but you still want to get a tax deduction. So these vehicles were created called donor advised funds, which are essentially a place where you can put money and still get the tax deduction, but you don't have to pick the charity at that in the rush. So they uh, I think they were invented in the early 2000s and they have since seen a dramatic uh, at first they didn't get a lot of traction. But in, in 2013, 2014, you read the article from the journal on the uh, uh, inordinate growth within these types of vehicles, especially at Fidelity. Yeah, I think it's also worth noting, you know, donor advice funds exist because moving money around is hard. Right. If charities are often not equipped to receive the types of things you're donating. So if you're donating, let's say you had a great year and you got a bunch of Google stock and you want to donate that appreciated stock and you want to donate it to a very specific charity, but you don't know that you want to do that until December 20th, it's going to be really hard to get that transaction done. Whereas Fidelity, which is a financial institution set up for these kind of transfers, they can get your fund set up in a matter of days, get that, get those securities transferred over, you get the credit for the tax deduction, and then you have a few more weeks to to actually make the final contribution for the funds to actually get to the charity that you intended. Um, but yeah, so basically ProPublica, um, you know, known for its kind of super in-depth investigative journalistic pieces. Uh, they've done a lot with the IRS. They've pulled apart tax policy in the past couple of years. There's an article from 2014, so a little, little outdated. Um, and I have some 2024 numbers for you on donor advice funds. So when this article was written, they were saying there was some statistics that there was about uh, about $50 billion in these donor advised funds. Now in 2024, we have almost $230 billion in these donor advised funds. So uh, it's been a good 10 years for investors. Um, it's been a good 10 years to be uh, making money off the U.S. economy. So good reminder to everyone that we should be uh, investing in the U.S. economy uh, and not overcomplicating our lives with nonsense. Uh, just, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's astounding, right? <laughs> Well, that's, that's what 400 percent growth in a 10 year period in and that, what what an interesting indicator of how well people are doing right this means there's general generational wealth coming down this means there's tons of income being made this means there's tons of appreciated assets that people are trying to get out of their estates like this is one of the most interesting that's a very interesting <laughs> yeah. uh jump there um oh so here's well, another, another oh go ahead well, another way to look at it is that the funds have been contributed to, you know, Fidelity or Charles Schwab, but they have not actually been distributed yep. to the charities. So if if these vehicles didn't exist, maybe this is not such a boon for charitable organizations, yep. because normally the big you know charities like the United Way or what have you would just be the default place for those funds to land. And then the funds would be deployed and said, we've got two hundred and fifty billion dollars of funds earmarked for charity that haven't been distributed yeah, they're yet. They're sitting there collecting funds from collecting fees from Fidelity and, you know, asset managers. You know, we have clients with donor advised funds. Brooklyn FI does not charge our clients 
an asset management fee on funds that are already in a donor advice fund. That doesn't sit well with me. I'm sure there are advisors out there who are like, I'm advising on the investments. So I should be paid for that. You know, we, the, the, the upside of a donor advice fund is if you put, yeah, let's Wait, poorly what? gray area. There. <laughs> well, what? I mean, you know, you are, it's part of the portfolio. If you're, deter- if you're trying to make the portfolio grow, you're managing it. Like that's a, a fee for service. Um, I don't agree with that, but I'm sure that is happening. Um, so here's an interesting fact is that if you have a private foundation, um, which a lot of folks who are very wealthy will start set up for themselves, which we'll get to in a moment, there is a, a law that you have to distribute at least 5%, an, an average of 5% of the assets of that foundation every year. So you don't have to do 5% every year, but you have to when we look at years on average, it's got to be 5%. There's no rules about distributing funds from a donor advice fund. So this money could be sitting in these donor advice funds for a person's entire life. Not maliciously, they just never get around to distributing it or they have they a disagreement. They already got the tax deduction. Yeah, they got the so tax break. Would, what's, what's the, the rush to actually... Yeah, and it's also like an ego thing, right? If, if you you know contribute $10,000 $10, into your donor advice fund in 2024 with the intention that you want to make a gift to, I don't know, your college or a fun or a, I don't know why you would ever do that, but, uh, the college has plenty of money. Thank you so much. <laughs> you want to make an, you want to, for your own ego, make an impressive donation. You might want to keep that money in the market for five, 10, 15 years. So you can make a sizable donation and have the Shane Mason, uh, accounting and finance library at Ole Miss, you know, look at somebody that's been, <laughs> Uh, a guy I went to elementary school with just donated 250k to Ole Miss. Uh, we went to school together, so don't. It it definitely <laughs> woke me up to the possibilities of having a, <laughs> a more ambition than I already have. <laughs> then again, he did go to Harvard Medical School and is a dad. Anyway, so uh, yeah, I mean, this yeah, is like I mean, this is like yeah. classic boomer finance 101, which is like take the tax break, kick the can down the road, uh, not improve society, just hoard money for yourself for a future that will probably not impact you negatively. So, well, I mean, the idea that charitable contributions are fully altruistic is misleading. I mean, the, anytime mm-hmm. you make a donation and you don't put it, give it anonymously, even if you do give it anonymously, there are, are sure are ways for people to find out who have made these contributions, uh, which <laughs> circles back, reminds me of the, have you seen the, um, curb your enthusiasm episode where he donates money anonymously? And mm-hmm. he just keeps running around the charity going, that's me. I'm anonymous. <laughs> yes, I, I am anonymous. It's a, whole, it's a great, a great episode of Curb. Uh, but yeah, we're also going to circle back to these private foundations. Like, and yeah, like if you were to make a big contribution to the Ole Miss library and you put your name on the building, like any person that graduates from that building, any VCs that know about you, like it just, it's also advertising for the amounts of wealth that you've accumulated and the success that you've had in the past and you will likely have in the future. So why not ally yourself with me? Ally yourself with me. Uh, Ally. <laughs> Ally yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't want to. So, yeah. It's, uh, and then we're going to see, like, that's one way of just like advertising for yourself. We have another article that we're going to discuss in a bit around private foundations that show much more self dealing and much mm-hmm. more self interest and retention of the rights to the property that has contributed uh, in a bit. Yeah. So, I would say this year, as we approach the end of the year and you're thinking about making charitable contributions, I like donor advice funds. I think they're great. I think they're great for our clients, especially if there's two of you in a partnership or marriage where you're not quite sure and you're not quite aligned on where the money's going. Make the contribution this year, but make a promise to yourselves to distribute the funds within a reasonable amount of time. One to two years to me seems pretty reasonable. Um, The best way to help out charities and causes you care about is to volunteer directly with them and give them money or appreciated securities directly. Um, That takes planning. So I get that. Um, So maybe start your charitable planning for 2025 now while you're thinking about this for 2024. Um, I like donor advice funds. Again, the cons are and, and charities you know, charities I've, I've heard, my sister actually works in, in kind of nonprofit work and she's kind of heard both sides of it and she's on the fence also, where it's like, I think they're good because people are donating more because it's easier, but at the same time, like we can't get the money out because people can't make decisions. Right. And if the money's there and the money's growing, it's hard to say, it's hard to say like, let's sell all of these, let's sell my portfolio in this donor advised fund and move it to cash to this uh, charity I care about. 
Let's uh, move on to the spicy article. This is a another ProPublica piece. Shout out to our journalists at ProPublica. Uh, the title is How the Ultra Wealthy Use Private Foundations to Bank Millions and Tax, Dedu- tax Deductions While Giving the Public Little in Return. <laughs> so the yeah. rich get richer. They're buying beautiful properties and art, and they're appraising them at... I don't know who these appraisers are, but <laughs> these works of these, these precious artifacts are getting appraised at tens of millions of dollars or in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and instead of using them for the public good, um, these rich folks are putting them in their backyard or pool houses in some cases and saying, it's my private museum, but you can only come on Tuesdays if your name starts with the letter J. Yeah, I mean, my takeaway from this whole article, AJ, just as a theme, we're going to discuss it in detail, but as a theme is that complexity is a tax on the rich. Like who and and all of this, all of this self-dealing that we're seeing between people that are supposed to be third parties, like this appraiser, right? Um, who there was a contribution of a house to a, a charity that was valued at one hundred and thirty million dollars by a third party appraiser. And that's what the IRS, IRS accepts as a value and allows for that person, this billionaire, to write off on their tax return as a charitable contribution. Right. So they got one hundred and thirty million dollar tax deduction, even though they bought that property for about forty million dollars just five years prior. Sure, there were renovations, but did they four X the value of it over five years? And who can is we, this sorry, appraiser? Can we just talk about how valuable we're talking when we talk about when we say charitable contribution? Like we are talking about a direct reduction in your taxable income. This is one of the most dollar for dollar valuable tax benefits you can have, right? This is yeah. not. This isn't like these aren't limit. I mean, there's there are some limitations, but for the most part, charity is basically an unrestricted tax deduction. Yeah, it's fantastic. And it's uh, and there's are gigantic deductions. I mean, this appraiser gave him one hundred and thirty million dollars of value, uh, which is more than any at the time, the highest higher than any value of any home that had ever been sold <laughs> in a third party transaction in the United States. By the way, I looked it up since then. Uh, Ken Griffin bought a two hundred and forty million dollar penthouse in uh, right on Central yeah. Park. So uh, no longer the I, I had a feeling it, that wouldn't last too long. Perfect. But yeah, so like so this appraiser is hired to do this job, right? How many other people is he appraising for? Do you think he's also appraising like $1 million homes or is he appraising a bunch of nine figure homes for billionaires to contribute to the IRS? And is he going to be incentivized to get hired on the next job because they gave a very high appraisal to the IRS and they got a huge deduction? This is a very niche appraisal work. Yeah, I'm I'm sure. Anyway, I don't want to harp on that too much, but yeah, they make this contribution to charity. Yeah, it's like it's by the way, we're talking about the Caro Lands ma- Mansion, which is 20 miles south of downtown San Francisco. It's this beautiful estate. It looks like Versailles right on the water. It's a Beaux-Arts Chateau, blah, 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 blah. It's gorgeous. I'd love I'd love to visit. I'd love to see the art. But uh, you can't. Right. <laughs> the the writer, the, the journalist starts by saying, like, I had to get on a list. I had to email six people. I had to wait, park in line. Like it was very hard to be able to see this art, which was granted a tax deduction because seemingly there was some altruism there where this billionaire was going to share this collection that they accumulated with the world for the greater appreciation of art. But that is not what's going on here. Well, yeah, I mean, when you're a billionaire, you don't need any more money, though, right? So what do you do need? You need prestige, right? Yeah. So what can you do? What is a, the classic strategy or a strategy that we see often that is quite complex is you donate a piece of property that is very close to where you spend a lot of time. And then it is a tax deduction for you. And then you still control it, right? You'll still okay. maintain it. You'll still keep it up to speed. You'll still keep it up to date. But if you're a billionaire, you're probably traveling a lot anyway, right? Like you probably summer in Japan and then you winter in New York or whatever the hell you do. I don't know. <laughs> so like you're not, you don't need to own this property outright so you can donate it to the public and then give them two hours a week (laughs) to go look at it. (laughs) And then you get to, you get to continue to use it and it's got to be clean all the time because the public's company, it's almost like the maids have to be around full time. Who cares? You're a billionaire. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, the crazy thing about this is like, there's very little risk to employing these strategies because we have a severely funded, a severely underfunded IRS, right? What was the audit rate on here? Uh, there's like a hundred thousand, of these tax returns that are getting filed uh, for these foundations. And what are they, an average of 225 out of 
a hundred thousand returns are getting audited. That's what a quarter of 1% of returns getting audited. Like I'll take those odds. Yeah. I'll self deal. I'll set up my foundation. I'll hire the shady guy to do the appraisal. Like what's the risk of getting, mm-hmm. there's almost zero risk of getting caught here. So why wouldn't yeah. I do this? Yeah. I ran the you're numbers. Almost, you're oh, almost an idiot. Oh. If you don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> right. The the uh, deterrence is very low in terms yes. of the risk of being audited. And the IRS has been routinely underfunded over the past 20 years, unfortunately. Unfortunately, every dollar we give to the IRS gets us six dollars back because of. Oh, is it six dollars? Oh, yeah. It's, it's a lot of money. That was four. Yeah. yeah six. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So if you were to randomly I ran the numbers on this 0.2 percent chance of being audited and across the hundred thousand dollar hundred thousand foundations that exist. If it was a random assortment, like the lottery, you would have to wait 400 years for your number to come up. <laughs> uh, so you're going to be dead by then. So why the hell not just so take why this not deduction? go for it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, taxes, people want to, people don't like paying taxes. And if you're in a state like California and New York, which has pretty high taxes as compared to the rest of the country, like you will do anything you can to avoid paying taxes to paying tax. And estate tax, right? That's what we're talking about here. Charitable contributions also get assets and property and art and securities and real estate out of your estate if you donate them somewhere else. Um, But if you could do you could donate them somewhere where your future generations could still benefit from them, like a library on your property or an art museum on your property that's next to your family home. (laughs) Like that makes sense. That was actually in this article. Um, but you know, right now, right now in this moment at the end of 2024, uh, we have another year before the tax tax cuts and jobs act is set to sunset right now. The estate tax exemption is what it's 13 and a half million dollars per person. Right. Mm-hmm. That's a lot mm-hmm. for most people. So for a married couple, it's almost 30, it's almost 30 million dollars we're talking about. Um, we actually have a proposal from the Dem- Democrats to bring that down from 13 million, 13.5 million to three and a half million. Um, so a 10 million dollar reduction in each individual individual person's estate tax exemption. That'll generate a lot more revenue for uh, schools and hospitals, my friends. So something to think about Uh as you cast your vote today, today is the general election for the next uh, U.S. president. AJ, AJ I'm totally <clears throat> embarrassed uh, by my math that I did here because I forgot about the estate tax when I ran the numbers here mm-hmm. earlier. Because mm-hmm. I was doing a comparison of if you were to take, if you were just to sell your shares in your company and pay 34% tax on them versus a contribution to charity, mm. which means which would allows you for a 34% tax deduction, which means instead of getting $76. Uh, you are getting a deduction that gets your net to $34. So that's like a 42% difference in net, you know, compared to paying the tax or making a contribution. But if you're going to pay a state tax on these things anyway, that's another 40% of a state tax. Yeah. So the 42% yeah. gain after the At, 40% a state tax, end, means right? it's only a 2% yeah. difference. And I'm, I'm ignoring an, a state estate tax. So it could actually save you money to give these things away if you're going to be paying an estate tax. Yep. Which yeah, I mean, is, it does. That's, yeah. Again, the and, algebra of deterrence is yeah. not happening here. Right. And, and in end of life planning and estate planning, charity is so much of the conversation, right? I mean, we experience our clients for the most part are you know, in the middle stage of their life, earlier middle stage of their life. But if you're at the late stage of your life, you know, you're thinking about your, you're good. You have enough money for the rest of your life, right? Mm -hmm. You don't need, you know, you at most you need tens of millions of dollars to pay for your, you know, living expenses and your staff. But if you've got hundreds of millions of dollars, you're thinking about where that money's going. And most people don't want to leave a hundred million dollars to their kids, right? So that money's got to go somewhere. Got to so go somewhere. It's got to go somewhere. And that's where we get philanthropy. However, if we had a more effective tax policy in this country, we wouldn't have people with hundreds of millions of dollars at the end of their life. But that's a conversation for another time. Um, anything else you want to say on this? For next week's <laughs> podcast, when yeah. we'll know uh, what kind of tax policy <laughs> updates we'll be getting from oh, yeah. the next week is going to be January. Fantastic. I can't wait for next week's episode. What are you um, going to do to avoid anxiety tonight? I am going to go to sleep at nine o'clock. I'm very tired. I had a big weekend. I saw Taylor Swift um, and I am going to watch the news from about seven to 9 p.m. And then I'm going to take an edible and go to sleep. Nice. Edible. Good addition. Very anxiety reducing. <laughs> 
I'm probably going to hang out with my buddy Johnny, <clears throat> Johnny Walker, uh, until about yeah. midnight. And then. And is, is Evan coming too? Evan Williams. Yeah, Evan he'll Williams. Be there. <laughs> yeah. He's coming later. <laughs> My boy, Dr. LaFroig's coming through. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Arbeg is going to be there there's, also. <laughs> well, there's going to be, actually, we're going to bring a teenager. Our, my 16 year old friend, Lago Vulin, will be there as well. <laughs> so, you hang out with a bunch of 25 year olds tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's going to be a 12 year old named McAllen there, perhaps, as well. <laughs> Uh, and yeah. oh boy, and yeah. maybe even Pappy Van Winkle if he wakes oh, up. Oh, good old Uncle he, Pappy is gonna stay, show <laughs> if he can stay up late enough. <laughs> if you can find him. <laughs> All right, y'all. That's our show tonight. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you on next week's episode of the Liquidity Event. Take care. Take care. Bye.